Welcome back to Area Diesel Service. So today we've got some new collaborative content for you. Not boltsandnuts.com, but we do appreciate them helping out other YouTube channels. Today we're going to bring you the number one most requested channel collaboration with fellow YouTube content creator Diesel Creek. So if you're not familiar with Diesel Creek, please go check him out. He has some of the best will it run, crusty rusty restorations and mechanical content on YouTube. We're big fans of Diesel Creek. Many of you have reached out to us, told us to get together with him. That day is upon us. In this box, which we've yet to open, is uh, an injection pump. We don't know a whole lot about it. Uh, we know that it's off of an international 3850 wheel loader. We got a little bit of the story. So I think Matt went up to Michigan and picked this thing up and it was in a non-running condition. We know that uh, he's got it back to his place, done some preliminary work, and has still not been able to get this thing to start. Another friend of ours, Watch West Work, also had some content on a 3850. He had some challenges with his machine. Matt had some challenges with the one he's got. Uh, we heard some of the story about the developments, so it sounds like the Diesel Creek machine cranks but isn't getting any fuel. He did mention that he was in contact with Wes and they did uh, all of the tricks to try to get this thing to fire off. Confirmed supply fuel to the injection pump. Confirmed that the return circuit back to the tank is open. Air and things to check and clean to try and get this thing to fire off and still won't go. Matt went into this pump didn't see anything glaring or obvious. During that uh, inspection or disassembly, I know he broke something. I don't remember what he said he broke, but something inside the pump broke. And that's when he reached out and said, all right, I'm gonna have to send this thing off to you guys for repair. We're gonna open it here on camera with you and see what we've got. We suspect that this is a, uh, we know it's a Stanodyne pump. We suspect it's a DB GFC 631-21AL. We're going to confirm that just in a moment. We've, we've got a note. We always like to get a note with a pump that tells us what's going on. So it's always handy to get the story to the injection pump technician and Matt has done that for us. So here's what we've got. I came, I saw, I made it worse. Please fix what I cannot. Matt. Uh, that's the story. We'll be sure to convey that to the technician. Got some pretty awesome Diesel Creek merch. Head on over to his merch store if you want to support his channel. And we have the proverbial bag o parts. One of the common questions we get is should I attempt this repair myself? and uh, we certainly don't want to deter anyone from trying to save a buck but many times this is what we get so someone's been here they've disassembled uh, i'm sure many of you are followers of matt's channel and he is a uh, extremely skilled mechanic and uh, if he can't get it done it would likely deter most of us from attempting it so we're going to unbox this see what we've got, do an assessment. Pump housing DBGFC 631-21AL. So the uh, guess in advance that the part number was correct. Just 
distributor head. All right. So this is a Stanodyne pump, formerly known as Rusa Master back in the day, Stanodyne today. So again, DBGFC 631-21AL. D, die cast housing. B is the pump model. G is the governor type. G in this context uh, indicating mechanical flyweights. F, flange mount. C, clockwise rotation. Six cylinders, so it's a six cylinder engine. The 31 is a 310 thousandths pumping element. And they generally live in here, but they are probably in one of these bags. 21 is bill of materials and calibration specification. And AL is what we call the accessory code. In this instance, AL, speed advance type pump with an electric shutoff. So electric shutoff right here. Uh, again, they weren't able to get this thing to pump any fuel. They did pop the cover and eliminate the electric solenoid as a potential culprit. And after that, uh, they went into this thing and tried to determine what was going on. Now that I'm looking at it, I remember he told me that he broke the cam ring retainer screw. And we'll bring you in here for a closer shot. But inside of this advanced housing is what looks like a little baby trailer ball and she's busted off so that does call for a special tool you can get it out without the tool uh, but you can also bust it so as soon as he broke that he said all right donezo from here called us up sent us out and this is what we've got so we'll unbag some of these smalls scatter them out and see if we see any smoking guns So here are the uh, components scattered out on the table. We certainly have much more trained eyes than my own. Uh, we'll let Corey take an initial look on this when we get this back into the, into the fuel shop. It doesn't look terribly dirty. I don't know what level of, uh, of cleaning Matt got to on this thing, but at first glance, you know, it's not full of contamination or rust. The pumping elements, obviously not stuck. They're laying here in the bag. They don't look terrible like they were seized up. Transfer pump blades are not completely chooched. The uh, transfer pump liner shows a little bit of wear, but nothing... Uh, necessarily crazy. Hard to tell from here about the condition of the head and rotor. I would say it shows some wear as well, but again, not my specialty. Yeah, that just made that a lot more challenging. A lot of times whenever that happens, I have to replace the housing. Any first glance smoking guns? As to why it wasn't working? Yeah. Um, he eliminated the solenoid, so we know that that wasn't the culprit. He confirmed quality fuel and a free flowing return. Yeah, I mean, everything looks pretty clean. That's what I thought. I didn't see any horrible contamination. They're stuck. Oh, this is the roller, isn't it? Yeah, that's the roller. Yeah, his plungers are froze up in there. At there least, at There's least two, at least to a point where I can't move it with a spring, which they should be completely loose. Yep, they're completely froze up. So that's your problem. You like on this? How it just has that little bit of a haze and just a little bit gets around them plungers and it freezes them up and then they don't work and if they don't go in and out then That's what's doing they the don't pumping. don't pump any fuel yep. 
Because even, you know, these springs have some crud on them. There was one that looked, yeah, I guess it was. Yeah, there. that one there. But, I mean. Yeah, I mean, everything really doesn't look too bad. Even these blades aren't terrible. You know, well, obviously they're. So he, I bet you he would have, had he not done that and got that out, I bet you he'd have got it running. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It may not have been calibrated perfectly back to spec, but if he no. would have got that out, freed those up, and got it back together. Yeah. He'd he'd have, he'd have got it running. You'd have seen a you'd have seen a happy Diesel Creek Yahoo if he'd have got her to light off. But. This is what we've got, and that's why it's here. So we're gonna bag this stuff back up. We'll write up our work order for the fuel shop, get this thing transferred back to them. We'll bring you along throughout the process. Corey's gonna be the technician again on this pump, and uh, we'll get his expert opinion. We'll get this thing cleaned up, fixed up, and we'll get her back out to Matt. So we'll bring you along throughout the process. We'll meet you back up here at the parts counter when this thing's fixed up. Back in my room here, we got this pump here from Diesel Creek. We, you know, me and Kurt kind of talked about it a little bit earlier. I haven't really looked at any of the other parts, so I'm going to kind of roughly do that now. The biggest thing with this so far is, unfortunately, with this cam screw being broke like it is, it makes it a lot more challenging because we've kind of hem-hawed around some other ideas that we might try later that we might take footage of. Uh, so we have a, it's called an EDM machine, so basically it uses a electrode to drill holes. So we had thought about maybe using that to either drill in through this way or drill in through the other way to relieve the pressure so the cam screw will come out. We also talked about doing a couple other methods which we aren't 100% sure how viable they will be. So we basically are gonna go back to the way that I normally do these whenever I have this situation which is not necessarily a great solution for the customer basically and because what I'm going to have to do I will try and take a chisel in here and try and break it loose with that it doesn't normally work that way but I have got it to work that way in the past so I'm going to try it again just to see but generally what I have to do is take a cutoff wheel and cut the bottom of this housing off and then take a pair of ice grips and break it loose because there's physically no other way other than you know we had talked about maybe welding a bit in there but with welding you know depending on what welder you have it could throw you know some slag pieces inside the housing which isn't a good solution either luckily the parts look pretty clean there is a little bit of gunk on some of the lower end stuff but Overall, it's I've seen a lot worse and we've made videos of a lot worse pumps. So this one actually ain't too bad. O rings left in here. Nothing in here is really. All that looks pretty good. Definitely needs cleaned up on the outside because it is dirty. Okay, so this is the power piston side. At first I thought that this was the spring piston, which it's not. So this one here is a little bit different than some of the other pistons that I've probably shown in previous videos. So this piston here, which you'll, I'll explain more once we take it apart, but this screw is actually inside the piston because there's a flange on the bottom side of it and there's a spring in there. So this piston here, oh, shouldn't have come out. Okay, I guess I just lied to you. See there? Yep, okay, I lied. Even an expert gets thrown for a loop every once in a while. So this is one of the few pistons, and I mean the few, that have this style that the bolt isn't held inside of here. Because normally it's a flanged bolt and the spring is inside. But I just got proven wrong on camera, so that's just great. I might know a lot, but every once in a while, you know. I haven't seen a piston like that in a while. So I took the piston ring off and I took the O-ring out that's underneath there. Basically, 
Your piston ring holds the pressure behind the piston, which lets your piston move, and the O-ring helps just capture more of the pressure. There are some of these pistons. There's some that don't use a piston ring at all, and there's some that don't use an O-ring. Not very many, but on occasion, they don't use it. Okay, hopefully that wasn't super tight. O-rings off of here. Okay, so these are his other two advanced springs. So this was on the power side, which was held inside that piston with the cap. This is on the spring side, which these are ones that have actually a little bit of contamination on them. They're not too bad, which they'll clean up fine, but it just shows that they're, you know, you know your pump is sitting like this on the engine generally. So all that contamination kind of settles in the bottom. So that's why your advance normally is the first thing that sticks. Also, one thing that is a little different with this one, normally you will have that adjuster is actually what adjusts your advance on the stand, but unless there are some occasions like on international pumps where that's just a static setting and you do everything on the spring side piston with shims which is how this one is actually because so someone has definitely messed with this before because you have those are your advanced shims which are actual standardine advanced shims well these those right there, I'm pretty sure, look like really big injector shims. So someone has had this pump apart previously and they felt the need that they had to adjust the advance, whether it's you know, someone out in the field or a different shop, I don't really know, but those are not the correct shims. So I will change those out for the actual correct ones that I have. Not that they don't work because a shim is a shim, but it's one of those, if I'm going to do it, I might as well do it right. So the blades have somewhere to them. Not a ton, but they'll get replaced anyway. Blades, spring, metering valve here. Actually looks pretty good. Yeah, so that has very, very minimal wear, so I'll reuse that. But it is missing. There should be a shim on here, and there should be a spring, which it might still be in this conglomeration of parts here. Uh, here's the spring. Oh, and I see the shim. So there's the spring, and there's the shim, so that's good. Normally, you can always find the spring, but normally this shim vanishes. It's a very thin and it likes to go to Never Never Land. That looks fine. This lever has a little bit of wear to it, but nothing crazy. That's just old ceiling wire. So that's fine. Which technically speaking, he didn't have to take the throttle lever apart. You know, it's fine that he did, but it wasn't 100% necessary. Yeah, like I said, overall, these parts don't look too bad. His rollers and shoes look okay. I know that he was originally complaining that it wouldn't start. And I can't remember exactly how much we talked about it before up front, how much we captured of that, but... Um, I know that Kurt said that he had eliminated the solenoid, so we know that wasn't causing the problem. I can't remember exactly. He checked the fuel flow, which that would be a common problem. Other than that, as long as the metering valve was free, it should have started unless there was something else deeper. I checked previously, and even just by sticking a pick in here, I mean, those plungers are stuck solid. So that's definitely his problem why it wasn't starting um, because those plungers have to be, I mean, like smooth as glass 
because if they hang up then you'll either you know it might affect your delivery or just won't pump at all the only other thought that i had thought of previously that i ran into before is sometimes these cam lobes will actually uh get flat so your rollers will hang up or one of them will hang up and then it'll literally wear down all those cam lobes until they're not really lobes at all they're just plateaus basically and it just won't pump any fuel or it'll pump very very little so the fact that you know the early sign that these rollers and shoes are in good shape means that the cam was at least in good enough shape to where the cam lobes are still fine it still might have a couple of chips on them which i won't know until i pull that all apart but as a you know early detection you know we are assuming that the cam was good enough to where it would have still worked uh these weights have a little bit of wear to them nothing crazy though that's all fine okay okay so it has all those parts so basically this is your governor spring and then your spacer and then your low idle capsule uh, some of them have that spacer ring in there some of them don't and there are different thicknesses of those so you can have this is your standard one that's basically what most of them will have sometimes international ones will have thicker ones or they won't have one at all so it just kind of depends on the pump so not every one of them will have it so that there is your um, advanced spring spacer so his spring set on there which this sat on there inside so this part here was inside the piston that was inside the cap and that was sticking outside the cap so it has a flat there and that's what that sits on so it'll actually adjust it while it's inside the pump is basically your way to do any changes which like i said this one here it'll probably have a static setting and then that's why it also had shims because generally if if this is static setting then it'll always use shims to actually change your advance but sometimes you'll have a little bit of movement so like you'll be able to move it like 300 thousandths you know 150 either way but i'll just have to figure that out once i get to the breakdown of the pump supply pump liner looks good so i'll probably reuse that yeah this check ball was free so that's good it's piston bolts delivery valve spring which it doesn't look broke bottom plug thrust washer looks good there's moon plates that were in the holding the rotor into the head so we had to take these out in order to slide the head part off cross shaft that went inside of the governor arm drive shaft looks fine so that's good now comes the fun part so that's his wear plate for this end plate so your blades a will make pressure but also so they don't wear into the, your end plate that looks fine now we will pull this fitting out so this is a pressure regulator so there's a spring and a piston inside of here which i've shown on some of my previous videos okay luckily the filter came off there we go so that just slides off there hopefully a lot of times that filter is fused to this o-ring here and you hardly can't really get them off a lot of times you have to rip them off so the suggester goes in and out and that's what changes my transfer pressure on the stand that 
looks fine. So we got our spring, which looks good. And our piston, which actually looks very good as well. This is one of the few times where I'm actually not going to replace that. Normally that's almost a 100% replacement item. But in this situation where it's still in good shape, well, there's just really not any need to replace it. And he actually does have a metal plug in here, which that's good. Sometimes they have a rubber stopper in here. Or it'll actually be like a rubber grommet in here with a little snap ring. And you have to replace those and put a metal plug in there. Just so it doesn't slide out later on. One thing that would have been nice whenever, you know, if it would have came to me all together. Is the fact that, you know, I would have pressure washed it and I would have blasted it before. So that way all the bolts would have been cleaner and fittings could have been a little bit cleaner. And this wouldn't get so much on my hands. It's just one of the things that overall it would have been a little bit easier for me and not even including the fact that the cam screw is broke which isn't necessarily 100 percent always you know the customer's fault because i mean it happens here too just not as often we have you know the correct tools and the knowledge to normally get them out successfully every time this looks good it has a slight crack here which isn't uncommon but it's not gonna hurt anything if it was very cracked then I would replace it but this one just being lightly cracked I'm not very concerned so here's the low idle screw pull this out mainly because there is an o-ring underneath here so you can see it's stuck there on the end. Which I'll leave that on there for now because that holds that washer on there. So I just stick a bolt in there because these fittings here, man, you just barely touch them and then they bend in and then they're basically useless. So I try and stick a bolt in there. Helps hold the sides a little bit better. Oh, there it went. Okay. There we go. Also what I'm going to do, so he doesn't have a check ball fitting in here, which I will put one in there and then screw this fitting into the check ball fitting, which basically that just helps hold a little bit of housing pressure inside the pump. So it just helps make sure it maintains pressure so you're not, you know, if you have a slight restriction in your return, you know, you're not building a little bit of pressure and losing pressure and it helps keep the pump a little bit more regulated. Now comes the fun part. I will cut this housing apart out there so that way I don't get a whole bunch of aluminum shavings here in my room. I would probably say out of all the pumps that I've done, the amount of times we broke a cam screw is probably or less so this really isn't a common problem but it is a, a big problem whenever it happens because it's just a nightmare to get it out and like I said you end up basically just destroying everything in the in the long run so I don't know if I tap those, I can get them to come out with a screwdriver, but... Yeah, no, I, I don't 100% know what exactly this goes on, but I can look, it'll tell me probably once I look it up. Just from the customer number here, it looks like an, interna an international of some sort, just because of, of the customer number, but I don't recognize the actual pump number, so I haven't actually looked up a breakdown on it yet so I don't know what it actually goes on so we'll figure that out later though so basically now we're down to getting this cam screw out because I can't get any of this out until I get the cam screw out because then the cam will slide out and then I can get everything else so I'll try and chisel it a little bit just to see if I get lucky and it'll break loose but 
I don't have a whole lot of hope for that. So we will move out to the other room and try and tackle it. I got the pump out here on my teardown bench, more in the dirty area because I don't want all those shavings in my room. Anyways, I'm going to start with this chisel and try and see if I can get it to break loose. But like I said, I don't really have a whole lot of uh, hopes for that. So if not, we're going to probably what's going to have to happen. So I will see. The worst part is these cam screws are so hard that you can't really get into them. To get it to get a group in there to break it loose. Just ain't gonna work. Those screws get so tight over time that they're just dang near impossible to get broke loose like that with it being without the actual bit being in there. So, basically what I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna have to cut this off so that way I can actually get to the end of it and grab onto a pair of vice grips and then break it loose that way. I know I have another housing that I can use. So what I'm going to do, so, shove this rag right here. Try and stop some of the shavings from going inside there. Need to cut a little bit more over here. Now, I got a lot more access. Oh, I got it there for a second. Yep. Okay. So, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and cut a groove in this and then try and get a flathead bit and get it like that. Again. Chance of success? It's a question. We will give it out one way or another. So. We're getting there. 
I basically down down to the point where I basically just have to cut all that off. And then try and then hope that it'll re relieve the pressure enough to where I can get it out. Got half of it ground down. Got it. Nothing left of it, but I got it. Let's see now. All that just to get that out. Whew. Yeah. But that's literally about the only way to get this rotor out if that's broke. Is to do that. I finally cut enough of it off to release the pressure off the cam and then it spun right out. So now I can get this cleaned up. I can pull this apart now. One thing I've also noticed is that this leaf spring is backed out like super far. It should not be backed out that much. It's still tight, but man, they either got the wrong leaf spring on there or it backed out on its own. I don't know if he backed it out. I don't really imagine that, but which he might have. But that was backed out probably way too far. See, like I said before, this uh, these plungers should just they should not have to get tapped out of there. So those were basically stuck. They don't really look all that bad, but it doesn't take a whole lot for them to get stuck and then it won't pump any fuel. So. So I will get all this cleaned up and then we'll go back to the room and get it put back together. Hopefully it'll go a lot easier than how it came apart. Okay, so I got it all cleaned up here. Did find another housing, got it cleaned up, which it actually looks really good. So that's uh, something I'm thankful for. One thing that was nice whenever I tore this pump apart was that his flex ring wasn't broke. So his weight cage is nice which I still think this pump has been rebuilt in the past because that's a reman weight cage so someone has messed with it before but it's maybe been a little while that all looks good let's make sure that thing actually goes together perfect okay so that should be fine go there that works good. Should 
checking for wear as well on some parts to see if they need replaced or not. Try and put this stuff halfway organized so that way whenever I actually go to build it, I know where all the parts are. Makes it a little easier on me. Okay, so overall this pump is in good shape. A, if the plungers wouldn't have been stuck and B, if he would have been able to get that cam screw out. You know, he probably could have just put it right back together and it probably would have been fine, honestly. I am going to have to replace this cam because I had to grind into it to get that cam screw out. This lever looks fine. It has a little bit of wear to it, but should be fine. It does look like I'm missing a timing window screw as well. Try to get those. Okay. So, honestly, I won't have to order that many parts and we should have all of them. So I'm 90% sure I got a cam. So that shouldn't be a problem. Got a nameplate, delivery valve and blades, and a pilot tube. So, it's looking pretty good, actually. Okay, so I got parts laid out, ordered my new parts, which obviously we didn't need that many. Gotta start off with my new pilot tube, or pilot bearing, whichever you wanna call it, which we always epoxy them in with five minute epoxy. I also like to uh, pre-test these. Okay, so that one goes in fine. Because some of the times they're tight and they don't want to go in. So. Nice coating around there. Slide this in, have my pilot tube tool. Just kind of preset it first and then wipe off some of this epoxy. And then I'll go for the final set on it. So now we'll actually So there, now it is set at the determined depth from the factory. So we'll set that off to the side while that epoxy dries and sets up. These are just some of my new parts that we got. Got new blades and springs. This is something that he didn't have previously, just as a check ball fitting that will go inside the top cover. So he originally just had, you know, his fitting stuck inside here. Well now, I'll screw this in here, and then this will go into his check ball fitting. I right, said so all this does is just helps regulate some housing pressure. Have our new delivery valve. And then our new gasket kit. Okay, so I got all the parts in there. Uh, we have decided to put the one piece weight cage in here, so I will have to make my new mark on that. I have the mark from, I have the degrees from the breakdown. So, got my timing wheel here. Set my new weight cage on here. And, so I got my degrees. Good. 
my good old power supply over there. Okay. Double check my mark. Fine. Now we got our new mark on our white cage. And we know it's correct. So, while I'm at it, I will put my new delivery valve in here. Also, curious on what that, what my roller to roller is going to be because, you know, I stated that it was backed out quite a ways. And see, actually, the way it is right now, I believe the rollers probably wouldn't even catch on that anyway. So yeah, because, let's see here. It was probably about like that. So, someone at some point, like I said, I don't know if he t tried to turn that out or whatever, but it was not correct. Still don't know if I really care for this leaf spring. Do this first and then I'm gonna pull that leaf spring off and double check it because it just doesn't quite look right, but maybe I'm just seeing things. Torque this delivery valve screw in. Yeah, I'm with so I'm gonna pull this off and See what a different one looks like. Yeah, I think it maybe sticks out a little bit more. So basically what I was concerned with, the distance from the edge here to the edge of the leaf spring. On his old one, it seemed like either this edge had been ground down or just the leaf spring itself just wasn't made correctly because there just wasn't much of a lip there to catch, you know, the the edge of the shoe. So I was concerned that in the future, you know, there could be, you know, if it's really pumping hard, one of those might try and pop out, which obviously isn't good. Which I don't necessarily see anything wrong different with this one but I don't know just didn't really want to trust it so I had extra ones so it's not that big of a deal rather be safe than sorry that one maybe looks a little bit better we know earlier that these plungers were sticking so and still feel them okay so now they're Spring up. Sometimes you just need to pop them out. I did clean this rotor up a little bit. So now those plungers, that plunger at least, is completely free. So that's good. Yeah, that's just like how it should be. So those are perfectly free now. So I have no doubt that they won't work. So we're good there. Okay, so my shoes are popped out. So that means that the air is coming through here, through my rotor and it's pushing on my plungers. I'm just gonna put a little bit of fluid in here. That is leaking a lot. So. I have to try and get that to where it doesn't leak. Because basically if it leaks off, then you could have um, basically poor cranking delivery. So poor starting fuel because it's bypassing around that screw and not going through your discharge ports. Sometimes you can just flip that screw around. If that doesn't fix it, then I'll have to grind that seat with a grinding stone. Okay. So 
So we went from that screw leaking a lot to now it doesn't leak at all. So now we know that all the fuel that this pressurizes will go through your discharge and not out back into your transfer pump. So that's good. So now with those pressurized still, I can set my roller to roller, which basically your roller to roller is just your dimension that helps with your fuel delivery. It just kind of gives you a, a spot of how much fuel it's going to make. So even there with it backed out that much, I was still low. Yeah. Okay, so right there is pretty close to where I want to be. And we still got a little bit of room to move. So compared to how that was originally, I have turned it in significantly. So now you can see that there's barely any gap between the back of the leaf spring and the edge of the rotor. Where before, I could probably dang near stick my whole pick in there because I was so backed out. So obviously it needed something done to it. I said whether he, you know, turned that out whenever he was trying to take it apart, I don't know, but regardless, it had to be reset. Okay, so that's all set. We know it's not leaking. We know that's correct. So I will put my cam ring on here. I am using a different cam ring than his original one just because I basically had to grind into it whenever I was trying to take that cam screw out. That was not going to work again. Now we got our weight cage. So that is on in the correct rotation that it needs to be. Then this, we got our knee timing mark on here. The line lines up with our dot here. So that's how you know that this is in time with the rotor, which is very important. If that was flipped around, then basically it'd be 180 degrees out. So. And with it being like that, it would not run right. Got my snap ring on there. While I'm at it, I'm going to put the new head o-ring on. Got our little moon plates, half moon plates here, which are called rotor retainers. This is just the little snap, the retaining ring that holds them moon plates together. And this is just a tool that you use to put them on easier. So that's on there now. Got to put our weights in. And then we have our thrust washer and our thrust sleeve. So as your weights, as you speed up, your weights go in and out like this, which then forces this thrust sleeve up and down, which is hooked to this and your little grooves here. So as that, basically if your pump was horizontal, as your thrust sleeve is going in and out, this is on a pivot. So then this goes forward and back, which is controlled with your, which is hooked to your metering valve. So basically that makes it so that forward is shut off and back is full fuel basically. So as, you're, as you speed up, your weights will eventually come all the way out, which pushes this all forward, which then will go to shut off. Also in the same way of if you're in low idle, you have basically no spring tension on your governor spring. So then since there's no pressure on the weights and they open up and then it cuts your fuel back to your idle fuel. So that way, you know, it'll idle at 650 RPM roughly. So that's kind of a general explanation of what all this does. It's basically all just centrifugal force that operates all of this. But you have to make sure that all these are set in here correctly because if one of them is out, then it will not operate correctly. Or it can dig into the inside of the housing and then you got aluminum shavings all inside your pump and of course that's not good. So that's at least set up now because it's been several minutes. So we will mount this on the vise here.
we will stick our governor arm in here. And this is our pivot shaft, which is what that pivots on. And you gotta make sure that's in there correctly. We've got an O-ring on each side. And we have two little screw plugs. I just put a little bit of grease on. Okay, so that is all moving correctly. I always put a little bit of grease on the inside of the housing. Also, what's really important is to make sure that your advance ports are open and that there's nothing in them. So, we got that in, got our pilot tube in. Now we can stick our head in, so I will tilt this down so none of my weights fall out whenever I slide the head in. The cam screw hole in the cam is already turned down, just so I don't have to try and slide it down later. So that's in there. If you're trying to put this in and you go too far, technically you're head o-ring can slide up into here and whenever you pull back out it'll cut it so you try and make sure that you don't push it too far in if you do most time I just replace the head o-ring anyway but I also have uh, plenty of extras so I also put my metering valve in so I had the shim and the spring on there this here is just a dummy shaft just so let's make this side my weights don't fall out so this is my bottom head locating screw. So I'm gonna put my two O-rings on here. And I got to torque this in. Now comes the important part. So I got a different cam screw. This is the correct bit for this. What I'm presuming is that either whenever he tried to take his out, it was just already weak, or if he didn't use the correct bit because a normal t45 bit will not work in these it's just slightly more pointed on each one of these points once you hammer it down in there it puts too much side pressure on it and it splits them off whether or not it was already his was already weak or if he just used the wrong bit i don't know but it is important to use the right bit i also whenever i install it technically you can use it whenever you take it apart as well but this is a bushing that goes in here just helps support everything so it doesn't break because I I have had these break whenever I went to torque them in okay so that's torqued in of course since uh, I had to already deal with this one being broke once you know you get a little gun shy trying to put the new one in you want to make sure that it doesn't snap if that happens that's when you just go home for the day and of course now I'm making sure that my cam ring is still free which it is all that's moving correctly basically now i'm just going to work on my advance area here so again this is something that i'm going to set once since this is on an international but once i set it then i won't change it after that international pumps are just kind of weird like that they don't like you to use the adjusting screw that they provide they for some reason like you to use shims i'm sure there's some engineer somewhere that could probably tell you why but i have not found that out yet got our new o-ring on here with some grease got our power piston cap so you have your power piston, which is the one with the piston ring, and then your spring piston. Two new O-rings for this. Now, like I said before, this one needs to be set. So on this particular pump, from the face of the cap to the end of the screw has to be 750 thousandths. And then once I set that, then I can't adjust it. I need to go in just a sketch. That looks pretty good to me. So that is now set to spec. I'll we'll put a little bit of grease on here. Now I gotta get my power piston here. This is a new quad ring that goes inside of this groove. Okay, so I got my new O-ring in there. The original piston ring. 
Normally I don't replace these piston rings unless they're broke, which they do break on occasion. I got my little uh, ring compressor here. I have to put that little spring spacer on this screw. So I got that in there. There's my spring. And then I can slide all this over top. So now that's installed. Put just a little dab of grease on there. And that just holds my little slide washer there. Which that slide washer goes against the cam. So basically, it's just so that way the cam screw isn't just pounding right into the end of the piston. Got my other, my spring piston cap here. Luckily this side isn't quite as involved. It had, you know, two of the correct shims and then two of the incorrect shims. So currently right now, I'm just going to put the two correct shims in there to start and I'll adjust the rest on the stand. Because even if I put those two shims back in it, it might not be right. So I'd rather just do it this way, adjust it myself, and then I'll know that it's right. So I put my little slide washer on there as well. And then screw these in here. Then basically all I got left is this bottom plug here. So basically now the advance is done. So now I just have my transfer pump in and then I'll turn the pump horizontal. So start off with the liner, which this is his original liner. I found no reason to replace it. Then we have our new blades and springs. New O-ring, a little bit of calibration fluid on there. Got our end plate here, which I blasted and buffed. I put just a little bit of grease in there to hold my little wear plate, which I try and just put the least worn side out. Try that side there. So then that grease holds that plate from falling out. Now I'll put our screws in here. And then we will torque these screws in. So now I gotta torque these in. If you torque these in too tight, then it could seize the head because it puts too much pressure on it. And the one thing you gotta check after you torque that on is make sure this is free, which that's smooth as silk. Sometimes if your liner isn't quite perfect, then that'll get tight whenever you torque that in. Pressure regulator here with your piston. Make sure your piston actually, yep, so that's nice and free. Got our transfer pressure spring. And we have our screw. I just set these screws into a basically a preset and then I'll set it on the stand. Okay, put my new O rings on here. Make sure this quad ring is not rolled. Good now. Let's put a little grease on here and put his original filter back on and put some grease on these two rings. You don't want to tighten this too tight because if you put too much torque on it, then you could snap this head off because it's not really the strongest piece in the world. That's why also if you're trying to put a fitting in, you always want to hold that side and then tighten your fitting because you could snap that off. You got my governor spring, spacer and then low idle capsule. So that goes in first. Got my guide stud with a new gasket. I'll put in my torque screw now too. Sometimes you need a torque screw and sometimes you don't. So basically all your torque screw does is it reduces the fuel 
delivery at your torque setting. So some pumps require less fuel at torque compared to like your main fuel setting. So that's just preset right now and I'll set that later if I need to. Okay, so basically now I just have my throttle shaft, which I will put his back together. From what I tell it was like that, just from the wear pattern on the shaft. Screw the screw back in here. I like to bend these little ears back a little bit on these lever springs. This feel it holds them a little tighter. That's back together. That's nice and tight. One thing I'm also going to do while I'm thinking about it is I'm going to check to make sure that both this, that both of these screws on this lever are actually going to break loose. Because sometimes they're froze up in there and then you can't break them loose on the sand. So that one's perfect. And that one there's loose. Okay, so that's good. Put my new O-ring on here. I'm also going to double check my shaft. Sometimes these shafts can go on either side. So I just like to double check to make sure that it is going back the way that it came apart. Especially like with this one since it was already apart before I got it. Because I have had instances where the shaft was on the opposite side from what the breakdown told me. So in that instance, normally I just put it back the way that it came because now every time I've set it, instead of following the way it came apart, going back to what the breakdown says, then I get it, then the customer gets it back. They're like, oh, well, my throttle shaft's on the wrong side. So I just set it back to the way it came in so I know that it's going to still work. And this is just a little clip that holds everything in. Okay, so now the throttle shaft won't come out. So just about now all I got left is I got to put this screw in here, which I'll do now. This is basically just a plug. On older styles stand line pumps, this is where the torque screw goes, but they're not very common nowadays. Normally now all the torque screws go in there. But some of the older housings don't even have that port there, so. So we have two new grommets for this solenoid. I slide them down. I can stick it in the top cover now. We have our two plastic insulators. Washers. That's all put together. I got my low idle screw here, which needs to go in with the new O-ring. Got my top cover O-ring. Now I'm gonna slide it on here. Yep, we're good to go. Front bolt. But the last thing I got is the check ball connector that I'm going to put in there. And then I'll stamp it. And basically it'll be ready to run on the test stand. Dope on there. 
keep it from leaking. And I like to wipe that excess off. That just holds everything tight for now. And I'll stamp it. Okay. So now that pump there is just fully rebuilt. And I really don't see any reason why it won't work on the stand, honestly. It was pretty clean. I think all his problem was basically that his plungers were stuck. So I imagine once I get it stuck on there that it will take right off. And like I said, the bet, only thing I might really have to adjust is the advance. I'll have to play with maybe the shims on there. But maybe I'll get lucky and it'll be perfect. So we will see once we get it on there. Okay, so got the pump on the stand on my ABM here. Haven't fired it up or nothing, so we'll see what it does here. Basically, got my inlet hooked up, got my return, got my transfer pressures hooked down here, got my solenoid wire on there, so it's working. Pretty sure I remember to tighten down everything. So, I'm gonna put some fuel to it and see if it pumps. Here she goes, contact! We got transfer pressure, so that's good. Going. Well, she's pumping. Basically now I'm just waiting for some of the air to get out of the pump, make sure that it's full of fluid. Then once that happens, then I'll speed it up some more so it can warm up because it has to be at a certain temperature to make it sure that it's a good test. Because if the fluid is too cold, then it will read differently than if the fluid is hot. So. I'm going to let it run there for a while so it warms up. I'll go write down my test specs and then whenever I come back, we'll be good to run her off. Okay, so it's all warmed up now. We're at our temperature that we need. So I'm going to start going through my test specs here. And I got to check my transfer pressure and my main fuel. Okay, so my main fuel was set just a little high, which is fine, but my transfer pressure was way high, and that's not fine. So basically, I just gotta screw out that adjuster. We'll try it right there, see what that does. Basically, I just gotta screw that adjuster in or out until I get it within spec. We're still a little high, so I gotta adjust it some more. Checking this reading right here, which is my transfer pressure, which is made by my transfer pump. So. That basically is from your inlet fuel coming in and then your transfer pump builds pressure which then goes through your head and into your advance and kind of operates the pump. So now I got that in spec. Now I slowed it down and I'm going to check my shutoff which is basically full. So I disconnect my power and I need to be under four cc's and I'm at basically zero. So that's good. So that's working. Now the critical part, cranking. So 
We're a little low at cranking. So basically I'm gonna turn up my main fuel and hope I can get it the cranking up high enough to where it'll meet spec, but we'll see, it'll be close. Basically that's meaning that uh, that this head is weak, basically. So whenever it's at its low speed you know low speed delivery, it's just getting worn out so it's not quite producing enough. Basically, I turned my main fuel up, and generally, whenever you turn your main fuel up, your cranking fuel will mostly follow it the same. Yeah, so now I'm making, hopefully, yep. Okay, so, with my main fuel being turned up a little bit now, now I'm making, I'm actually meeting my cranking spec, so that's good. Because if I would have left my cranking fuel well, then it might not have started the engine. Now, basically, I'm going to set my vance, which is through here, which I'll then I'll set with those shims. So, even though I took those two shims out of the vance, the way I have it set now, it's perfectly in spec. So, it just goes to show that, you know, you still might have to change things, even from how it was built for you. Now I'm going to speed it up and then set my high idle and then go down and check my full load fuel. So right there is governor cutoff, so that's your weight fully opening up and pushing the metering valve all the way forward to cut off. Right there I needed a max of 7 cc's and we're getting zero, so that's very good shut off. At full load I'm making too much fuel, so that's where I'm going to turn in that torque screw to decrease my fuel delivery at my torque setting, at full load setting. So I need to have 47 cc's, so I'll set it, you know, a little, maybe a little over the Basically now, I set my full load. Now all I gotta do is set my low idle, and then it's gonna be done. See, I went through, I've set everything. Of course, I had to change some of the settings. Left some of the settings alone because they were fine. Now everything is in spec. I just got to pull it back off and I'll cap it up, wire seal it, paint it, and send it back out. Okay, so I got back in the room here. I'm going to mount it back on my vise. Stick my dummy shaft back in here.
Okay, line my dots up. Okay, so I got all the seal wires on here. Basically, a lot of these are just a tamper-proof wire in a sense. So, you have one across your end plate, so I, you know you can't take the end plate off. You have one across here, so, so you can't change your main fuel or your full load fuel, your torque setting, basically. This one here is for your high idle, so you can't change how many RPMs it runs. Um, this is just a tie back so that way you can take the drive shaft out if you need to uh, whenever you're installing it on the engine and just so I, it will hold the weights in. So I then basically once he sticks it in the engine and puts his mounting bolts through there then he can unhook this and it'll then he can hook his linkage up to it. And basically the bottom one is just for so you can't adjust your advance so that way you know it can't be tampered with so yeah basically that's just the gist of it is they're basically just tamper proofs and if it were to come back you know then and one of them was cut off then you know if something happened you could say well you know you were messing with this and this may have caused this problem so basically that's kind of why we do it and you know put caps on everything so so I, a it doesn't leak out and so I, whenever i paint it paint doesn't get in there so that's basically what i'm down to now is i'll go wash it all off and i'll throw some paint on it and it'll be good to go There you have it. Pretty awesome adventure through the repair of this injection pump for our friends over at Diesel Creek. What did we do? You guys saw it live and in action, but to summarize, uh, disassembled what was left of the pump. That turned into some carnage, if you will, and kind of speaks to whether or not you should attempt this repair yourself. I'm 100% confident that if Matt would have gotten that out, he would have finished the disassembly and he would have gotten to the stuck plungers and I don't think we would have ever seen the pump. Should you attempt it, that's up to your mechanical abilities. If you are going to attempt it, you may consider this sleeve and this bit for removing the cam retaining screw. We've got those in stock. That's a pretty regular sale item for us. Keep in mind, this is what we consider repair level work, right? Matt's crusty, rusty wheel end loader won't really command the price that a what we're going to call fully remanufactured pump will run so this is repair level work right here's what we got can you make it work give it a, an expert trained eye once over you know do what is obviously necessary and logical 
but don't go to the extreme of every last nut, bolt, wear item, etc. You saw it, but this particular pump gasket kit, uh, we did do the solid weight retainer upgrade, so you've seen that before where the flex ring deteriorates, plugs up the return, pump quits working, so we've eliminated that. We've gone to the solid weight retainer cage in Matt's pump. We did come up with a used housing. Uh, we ended up replacing the cam, cam screw, delivery valve, blades, and it didn't have a return connector when it came in, so we've put a return connector in it. Had you have uh, been required to purchase a new housing and a new cam ring along with the other components and the repair and calibration labor, this thing would have been north of $1,600. Oftentimes we've got harvested cannibalized components from other pumps that catastrophically failed in other regards, right? We're hoarders, we're, we're guilty of hoarding, but it's a service that we can provide. You don't necessarily need to spend $600 for a pump housing. It doesn't really do anything. The only problem with it was Corey had to destroy it to get the rest of the innards out of this pump. Calibrated the pump he did have to turn it up a little bit to hit the cranking specification. So the most critical specification of delivery is probably the cranking specification. Engine cranking speed is critical to this pump's ability to start the engine. The most critical area for this pump to make delivery specification is during cranking. At higher RPMs it can overcome some of the wear, but at cranking it's, it's mission critical. So that's what we did. That's what it cost. We've broken these retaining screws ourselves, so there's nothing to say that we wouldn't have done the very same thing. It is what it is. Uh, we like to say that an expert in a given field of study is only someone who has made every possible mistake, right? So we've done this. Matt's now done it. We've learned from it. It cost us a housing and a cam ring. No big deal. That's what we do here at Area Diesel Service. So that's a summary of what has gone down. We appreciate you guys letting us know of the different opportunities with other channels as far as collaborating with them, helping them out with fuel injection, turbocharging, we do rotating electrical, engine components, water pumps, right? If it's diesel, we're likely involved or capable of sourcing. If you've got another channel that you're following and it looks like they might be able to use our help, please let us know, please let them know. Uh, this is what we like to do. We appreciate everybody reaching out, letting us know about Diesel Creek, and we appreciate Diesel Creek sending us something to work on and, and save this old crusty rusty from the scrap heap. If you do need our services, and if you mention that you learned of us through this collaborative content with Diesel Creek, we'll take care of covering the outbound shipping on your product or your project, and we'll throw in some area diesel swag. Uh, we've got a couple one size fits most hats, pretty slick design here, and we've got some mechanics gloves. If you want to support us and you don't have a current project, we've got this stuff in our swag store, right? We've got a uh, winter hat and a summer hat, mesh back ball cap, and then we've got two sizes of gloves. We've got large glove and we've got larger gloves. If you want to support us, you can hit us up there. If not, we just appreciate the views and uh, folks reaching out to us. We can be reached at 800-637-2658. That phone number reaches all of our locations in Iowa, Illinois, and Indiana. You can email us at parts at areadiesel.com. You can jump on our website at areadieselservice.com where you'll find a large amount of high quality information and the ability to chat instantly with the diesel engine expert through the button in the bottom right hand corner of your screen or stop by, see us in person, we'd love to meet you. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Contact.